So hello everyone, my name is Nathan Longbotham. I appreciate you guys joining us today. Um, we have a um, very interesting session today uh, focusing on geospatial startups. Um, but before we get into that, and I hand that over to the presenters today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about GRSS and specifically the tie, uh, tie activities that we have going. So technology, industry, and education activities are something that we have been putting on for multiple years at IGARS. Um, with IGARS going virtual this year, uh, we've moved also moved the TAI activities virtual. So this is part of that series and it will run through the fall. So be sure to follow us on um, Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, or join one of our email uh, lists to, to get updates about future webinars. We'll have um, two inclusion and diversity seminars, uh, uh, fireside chats and panels um, next month, as well as a presentation by SpaceNet. So um, yeah, please tune in and follow us to, to keep up to date with those details. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Kevin Corbley, who is moderating this, uh, this presentation today. Um, Kevin. All right, terrific, Nathan. Hey, thanks for the introduction. And a quick thank you to, to a GRSS for hosting this workshop on starting a geospatial business. Um, Nathan and I came up with this uh, idea for the webinar actually last year at IGARS 2019 in Japan. Um, we did a business uh, seminar, actually I did. Uh, it was quite successful and based on the questions we got, we realized that there were a lot of people in the geospatial community with backgrounds in science or engineering that had an idea for a product, a service, or a business, but they just didn't know how to get started. And so that became the genesis for this workshop in 2020. Um, and so we're really going to focus on the basics of what you need to do to get a startup uh, off the ground and then to, uh, to keep it going once it's uh, operational. Um, and we've assembled an all-star panel today. You see the, the lineup on screen. And uh, let me go into the, um, into the agenda for today real quickly. Uh, we're going to start off with legal considerations when forming a tech startup. That's by Kevin Pomfret, a partner at the Williams Mullen Law Firm in Virginia. And then we're going to talk about show me the money, sources of startup capital. That's something everybody wants to know about. Caroline Gash, the principal consultant at Globe Consulting Group in Denver, will be um, presenting that topic. Uh, then we're going to move on to in achieving investor impact in the brave new world of virtual pitches. And that will be presented by Dr. Shawana Johnson, GISP. She's the president of Global Marketing Insights in Cleveland, Ohio. And then I'm going to wrap up uh, with uh, a topic I call marketing a startup, exploiting your USP. And uh, I am the uh, president of a company called Corbley Communications in Denver. And um, at the end, we will have time for live Q&A. As Nathan just said, you'll be uh, submitting your questions uh, via the chat window. So, uh, so please go ahead, do that at any time during the presentation. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce our first speaker, Kevin Pomfret. He's a corporate partner at the Williams Mullen Law Firm where he represents government contractors and technology companies on a variety of matters, including mergers and acquisitions, investments, licensing, private and cybersecurity. He's co-chair of the firm's unmanned systems practice group and the data protection and cybersecurity practice group. Kevin is also the founder and executive director of the Senate Center for Spatial Law and Policy. Kevin Pomfret is recognized as a leading authority on the legal and policy issues associated with geospatial information management. He has presented at congressional hearings and the United Nations committee meetings, and he's a member of the US Department of Commerce's Advisory Committee on Commercial Remote Sensing and the UN GGIM Working Group on Legal and policy frameworks for geospatial information management. He's also an adjunct professor on geospatial law and ethics at Johns Hopkins University. Kevin began his career as a satellite image analyst at the National Photographic Interpretation Center, NPEC, uh, which is a predecessor to the current NGA. He's a graduate of Washington and Lee School of Business and Bates College. Kevin, welcome. Well, thank you, Kevin, and thank you for the introduction. I, I 
you don't know how how long something goes on until you hear about your bio until someone reads it. And I realize that that's probably a lot more detail than member, many of the folks here need to know or want to know. So I'll, I'll make a mental note to sort of cut down on that. I apologize for having to, to listen to that. Um, so um, yeah, this is a, a topic that uh, I really enjoy talking about because it combines sort of two different aspects of my career and background. One is a geospatial person and the other is a, is a corporate lawyer. And so to be able to you know, talk to people who are interested in developing a business around geospatial is always really um, interesting and exciting for me. Um, today, uh, just in the interest of time and because we've got such a diverse group of people, I'm just gonna talk at a very high level of some of the, some of the considerations <laughs> when, you're, when you're forming a company as to might, what you wanna, might wanna think about. Um, so the first topic is gonna be the, the corporate structure. Um, and so one thing you want to think about is just what structure, and, I, and I'm going to you know, maybe start by saying that this is, uh, will be U.S.-based terms and provisions um, because I'm a U.S. lawyer, but most other countries that I know of will have similar type of organizations or, or corporate structures, if you will. And so if you're not from the U.S., you, know, you may want to talk to a local lawyer to see which, which type of organization, what type of structure works for you. And the considerations you want to think about is one limited liability. So if you're a sole proprietorship and you don't you don't create a, a company or some sort of organization around you, if you were to get sued, they would be able to go after your assets, right? So a lot of people, most most organizations now, because it's so relatively easy to set up, will set up either a corporation or a limited liability company or a partnership. And one of the other considerations you need to think about are the, are the tax consequences of that. So an S Corp, for instance, or a limited liability company, or even a partnership are considered pass-through entities. And at a very high level, that just means that uh, expenses and um, uh, revenue sort of goes through the, the, the entity itself to the individual. And there are some tax advantages to that, particularly when you're getting started. And there are some tax, um, negative tax consequences with that. Um, and also some other limitations associated with that. So being aware of that and asking your advisors, your legal advisor, your financial advisor, your accountant, you know, which suits you is important to, to consider as well. Um, when I think, when I talk about ease of use, so, you know, corporations and an S Corp and a C Corp in the United States are essentially the same in terms of their articles of incorporations, bylaws, the designation of an S Corp or a C Corp mostly has to do with how the, um, the, the IRS treats it in an election that you make. So those are very standard. You've got uh, articles of incorporation, you've got bylaws, you've got shareholders agreement, and there's some flexibility in putting those together, but there's a, there's a structure associated with it. Whereas a limited partnership or a limited liability company or partnership, there's a lot more flexibility in what you can do. And so, that's great. I like to tell people that the benefits of a limited liability company is you can do whatever you want to do with it in terms of management, um, structure, equity interest, those type of things. But there's also a risk, right? So you want to make sure that you, you don't put too many bells and whistles into an organization when you're getting started because it just it makes it more complicated. Another important part of the ease of use is when you give out corporate entities, that's called equity, that's stock. Um, limited liability company has membership interest, partnerships have partnership interest, and as I'll talk about in the next slide, that can have some interesting consequences as well. When I talk about your business plan in terms of the consideration for what structure to use, so for instance, if you plan on being primarily a government contractor, you're not going to raise outside capital, at least from a venture capital group. You may want to go with an S Corp over a limited liability company because of the government contracting rules around billing rates. Simple thing, but if you don't know that when you're getting started, if you don't talk to an accountant or a lawyer about that, you may you may you know trip over that. If you're going to do different types of capital formation, you may want to do a C Corp rather than an LLC or an S Corp because, for instance, an S Corp can only have a certain number of shareholders and it can't have foreign entities as shareholders. Next slide, Kevin, please. So I'm not gonna go into a whole lot of detail around capital formation because um, Caroline and, and Shawana are gonna talk about that in greater detail. But the point I wanted to make here is that when you're, when you're looking for, when you consider what sources of capital you're gonna go for or, or you think fits yourself um, best, 
you want to think about the structure that goes with it. So, for instance, the, at the highest level, most venture capital organizations, most venture capital firms don't like to invest in pass-through entities. And there are always exceptions to that rule, and there are some very typical or very um, you know, technical issues associated why they want to do that because it's a pass-through entity. But having a corporation that's a, a, a C corporation is often a, a, something that a venture capital group would look for. So if you're considering going down that route, you may not want to form a limited liability company. That doesn't mean you can't change in the middle and make a limited liability company into a corporation, but there's additional costs and expenses associated with that. So understanding how you're going to, how you're going to do that. You want to think about the repayment terms um, in terms of what you want to use the money for, how you're going to be able to repay it. Um, you want to think about how much equity or ownership you're going to give up, right? Because there's a if you have outside investors, if you want to give up equity or ownership in the company, they're going to put a value on that company to figure how much they what how many how much equity they want in return. So that's an important consideration going forward. Your exit strategy: Do you plan to continue to just grow this company yourself? Are you looking to be bought by a um, by a strategic partner, someone else in the industry? maybe a bigger company who might be interested in your technology or applications. That's an important consideration in addition to your legal requirements. So if you're issuing equity to th third parties, you need to consider in the U.S. security law filings. Next slide, please. Because this is a very technical um, industry and business, it's important to keep in mind various intellectual property rights that you may have. You may have a patent, um, which is basically a right granted by the U.S. government to exclude others from making or using or selling your invention. And those typically are granted in the U.S. for 20 years. But you need to consider, do you want the patent in the U.S.? Do you need to have patents internationally, what those filing looks like? So you need to think about not just in the U.S. in this global market, but also internationally. And there are costs associated with that, and there are, are risks and benefits associated with that. So that's something to keep in mind as you build and grow your business, particularly if you're going to be developing patent um, technology. When we talk about trademark, I think the, the Apple logo is an example. The McDonald's M are examples of trademarks. Marks that could be associated with a trade or in the case of a service or with a um, service marks with respect to a particular service. If you have something that you want to um, develop, um, you know, you may consider one of getting a trademark and filing that with the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office. Copyright is something that most people in this industry are very familiar with with respect to uh, software. Um, so that's something you may want to consider in getting copyright protection and registering for that as well. But it's also important to think about with respect to data, um, not only with respect to data that you're collecting and using in the geospatial community, but also if you're using other people's data and whether your their data is subject to copyright. And the copyright issues around data are confusing uh, and complicated and um, not always, um, you know, they, they don't always make sense. Um, so it's important to keep that in mind, not just for software, but for but for data. And then also trade secrets, which is more of a common law or state type uh, provision. There is some federal protection as well, but these are just information that you, you don't necessarily have a copyright on or trademark on, but it's important to your business. You've made an effort to protect it so that it's not shared with other people. And that's often, a big part of, of, of companies that are just getting started. And you wanna make sure you protect those as well, even if you're not registering them with the, with the government to, um, or filing to have those registered. Next slide, please. And then just some other considerations that um, you know, I think are important as you're getting started. Getting a good accountant who understands your business, who understands your industry. There are some unique tax issues associated with various types of um, technologies, there are sources of funding, there's things that you need to be able to do. Some accountants are very good at that particular aspect and some are just more um, general corporate and there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're gonna get into a field which requires um, unique grants, if it's gonna get into a field that's gonna be government contracting, um, you wanna get an accountant who understands that and can advise you early on. Estate planning, as you build and grow your business, Keep in mind that, you know, for many entrepreneurs, this is their biggest asset and you want to protect that. You want to make sure that you've thought through what happens upon your death. If you're entering into an agreement with a partner, uh, what happens upon his or her death. You want to think about divorces. You want to think about the tax consequences as you grow. Um, they will vary for each one individual, but they are something to, to think about. 
Non-disclosure agreements, as I said, you've got trade secrets, you've got other kind of financial information, you wanna make sure you have NDAs that are protective of you. Um, and when you, you are entering into agreements with third parties and they require you to protect confidential information, you wanna make sure you've got um, you know, the right protection on that and you're not subjecting yourself to a lawsuit down the road because you're planning on using some information that maybe you developed yourself, but may be arguably covered under a, someone else's NDA. And then also important to consider your employment agreements and your independent contractors agreements. You wanna make sure that you have non-compete and non-solicitation clauses that both protect you, or but also are legal under the state by which this agreement applies to, because this is very much of a state law issue, and you need to be able to make sure that those agreements comply, or otherwise they may be thrown out of court. Again, you wanna protect your confidentiality of information, and you wanna make sure that you uh, make sure who owns any intellectual property that your employment, your employee or your independent contractor develops. You don't wanna go down the road, try to raise money and find out that actually someone else has intellectual property rights in your technology and then you need to go back and get that from him to her and maybe you have to pay for it or give up equity or something like that. And Kevin, I think that's it. All right, terrific, Kevin, <clears throat> appreciate that. And yes, yeah, I was listening to you, I was thinking uh, the startup phase uh, just for my own business, um, you really uh, have to have at least at minimum a, a lawyer and an accountant uh, to make some of those early decisions. That's uh, main, you had a lot of great points, but that's the main takeaway uh, I came, uh, came away with there. So appreciate that, Kevin. And uh, next we are moving on to uh, Show Me the Money, Sources of Startup Capital with Caroline Gash. <clears throat> Let me tell you a little bit about Caroline. She's the principal consultant at the Globe Consulting Group in Denver, Colorado. She has extensive experience raising capital for new and high growth ventures, as well as firsthand entrepreneurial experience in founding and growing an energy focused private equity firm, uh, which was Denver based Coachman Energy Partners. Uh, she left there in 2018 to focus on venture capital and angel backed en endeavors. Currently, Caroline is an active board member on startup and Venture Capital Board. She also serves as a contract CFO and strategic advisor to entrepreneurs and growth-oriented investors through her role as principal consultant at Globe Consulting. Uh, Caroline holds both Master of Finance and Master of Business Administration degrees from the University of Denver and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Notre Dame. Caroline, take it away. Great, thanks, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Uh, before we jump into where to look for startup capital, I thought I would just give you an idea of the immense size of this market. Funding for startup capital peaked in 2018 at over 300 billion US dollars in global investments. That was followed in 2019 with almost as strong of an investment of $280 billion in startup funding. We've seen a little bit of a contraction in the first half of 2020, with $130 billion in investments for the first half. That's down roughly 6.5% from the same time period in 2019. The good news is that this is better than expected given the global pandemic that began earlier this year. Next slide, Kevin. So there was a survey done earlier this year that asked startup founders what their number one concern was regarding the global pandemic. And their answer was startup funding driving up, drying up. Thankfully, we haven't seen that happen. In fact, there are some industries, particularly the biotech industry, that have actually grown throughout 2020. So the moral of this story for all of you is that if you have a good idea, please do not be discouraged by the current pandemic and economic landscape. The sentiment is that the next couple of years will be ripe for founding and funding successful startup companies. Next slide. So on your screen is the startup J curve. And what this illustrates is the path that the vast majority of startups take with regards to revenue and cash flow from your initial investment into the company to create a business plan and perhaps a prototype to your first customer and revenue and finally to that high growth scaling stage. If I leave you with only one thing today, let it be this, 
fundraising is all about finding the right fit. There's an investor for every company and there's a company for every investor. So let's start with the most common capital sources for the initial stage of the business, the concept stage. Next slide. All startups begin with some level of personal investment. It's not only a natural place to start, but it's also important to show your future capital sources that you have what's called skin in the game, that you're committed to the venture. You may have heard the term bootstrapping before. Bootstrapping is simply building a business from the ground up with only your personal savings. And if you're lucky or if you're really, really good, the cash coming in from your sales can fuel your growth. However, the vast majority of startups will need guidance um, and graduate on from personal investment to what's termed in the industry as the three Fs, family, friends, and fools. This is not only your closest sphere of influence, it's also your closest network. In the earliest stages of companies, investors base their investment on the relationship with the founder and with their confidence in your ability to solve the identified problem. So who better to fund your startup than those who know you best? Finally, for some companies, there may be grants available to help with this initial stage of funding. Grants are a phenomenal source of capital for your, if your startup qualifies, because the money comes without the founder having to give up any ownership or any equity, and with no commitment to have to pay that money back. It's virtually what we call free money. It used to be that grants came solely from government organizations, whether it was national, regional, or local. Those governments identify a specific problem that they're looking the startup to the startup community to help them solve. However, we've seen increasing amounts of corporations over the last handful of years looking to enhance their own ecosystems and starting their own uh, granting initiatives. So there are companies like Visa, FedEx, even Amazon that have rather large corporate granting initiatives for startups. Next slide. So hopefully in your startup, if you've seen some success from the previous slide, the next place to look for capital as we move up the J curve from concept to seed funding is one of these sources. Beyond the actual money that these sources come with, their real value is in your opportunity to evaluate market viability, enhance your business acumen, and expand your network. All three of those will be invaluable as you go to move on to raising additional capital in the future. I think most of us have heard of business plan pitch competitions. They're fun and they're becoming increasingly popular. They're kind of the shark tank model of fundraising where a founder presents his or her business plan to a group of experienced entrepreneurs in hopes that they get a small amount of funding. However, since only a handful of companies will receive funding through this mechanism, their real value is in your ability as a founder to get in front of a large group of potential investors, clients, and stakeholders who can give you feedback on your business plan and ultimately will lead to future capital. When we move on from there, we have incubators and accelerators. Incubators are a place for you to get help with your startup business model. Accelerators are really best suited for startups that have already created a business plan and are looking for niche mentorship to help accelerate the growth of that startup. Both of these avenues come with a vast amount of resources to help you get your business off the ground and even to begin the scaling phase. Incubators actually usually charge a small fee to go through the program but they can help you hone your pitch so you're better prepared to raise capital in the near future. Accelerators actually provide a stipend for founders to attend the program, but in exchange, accelerators will take a small ownership stake in your company. The best accelerators, like the ones on your screen, will come with not only a financial investment at the end of the program, but they will also lead to important introductions to other investors. Finally, we have crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is good for raising small amounts of capital from lots of people relatively quickly. The true power of crowdfunding is in testing market viability and enhancing your market visibility. So as we move on, next slide. Once your business plan is developed, 
you have a prototype designed, you may even be generating revenue at this point. You've graduated to seed funding and perhaps even to series stage of funding. Angel investors are high network, high net worth individuals who invest in startups. Angel networks bring many angels together around a common affinity to write bigger checks. The beauty of angel investors is that they bring not only money to your startup, but they also bring guidance and other qualitative skills necessary for you to grow your business. Finally, we have venture capital firms. They're the most traditional and most competitive place to look for startup capital as they employ professional money managers. While Silicon Valley is famous for its concentration of VC firms, there are many smaller VC firms popping up all across the map. And I can guarantee you that you have a VC firm or an angel network in your backyard that you just don't know yet. To locate both angel investors and VC firms, I have a couple of pieces of advice. The first is know the profile of your ideal investor. As I mentioned before, investing is all about finding the right fit. So know the ideal, ideal profile of your investor and then target the angel networks or VCs that fit that profile. Additionally, make sure that you're thinking local. Many angels and even VC firms are interested in not only pure economic returns and investing in your startup, they're also interested in investing in the entrepreneurial landscape of their backyard, which ultimately is your backyard. And finally, like everything in life, network, network, network. As I mentioned previously, investors are placing a bet on you and your ability to navigate the choppy waters of founding and growing a business. Warm introductions are invaluable to building trust that's required for forging relationships with potential investors. The final thought that I'll leave you with is that it is simply wrong to think funding is only about funding. Startups can have all of the monetary capital in the world, but without the right human capital to provide proper guidance and support, more often than not, that startup will fail. Therefore, I'd encourage you to identify investors who will celebrate your passion for the problem you're solving. Starting a business is a full contact sport. It is not easy. So find investors who will support you throughout its challenges. Additionally, think of investors as your teammates, just as you would your business partners, because that's exactly what they will become. Make sure that they're excited about not only bringing their money to the table, but they're also excited about bringing their expertise, their time, and their networks to the table to help you leverage the collective wisdom of the entire group. My final piece of advice, be tough. To be a founder, you must have resilience and perseverance. 0.6% of founders who pitch to angels and venture capital firms receive funding. That means that you can reasonably expect to pitch nearly 200 times before receiving money for your startup. You're going to hear no a ton. Just remember that no only means not now. Keep in touch with everyone you speak with as there will be a time when that no could turn into a yes. So with that, I wish you all the best in raising capital for your startups. All right, <clears throat> terrific, Caroline, thanks for that. And uh, there's so much good information there. You really walked us through the process and that's uh, also a terrific lead in to our next presentation. But before I introduce Shawana Johnson, let me just give you a quick reminder. We're already getting uh, some questions. I'm looking over, I have a laptop over here. The questions are coming in. We already have some coming in. Go ahead, send them in uh, in the chat window. Nathan is uh, curating them in the background. And uh, let me get right to it. Our next presentation is called Achieving Investor Impact in the Brave New World of Virtual Pitches, which is very appropriate today. And uh, our speaker is Dr. Shawana Johnson, President of Global Marketing Insights. Um, she is a subject matter expert in commercial GIS and geospatial intelligence uh, in leading edge technology areas such as global mesoscale satellite imagery, high performance geospatial cloud analytics and delivery, uh, new space and the 5G and internet of things data um, with focuses on areas like global food security, water resources, energy and national security. 
As CEO of Global Marketing Insight, she serves um, an international client base, providing geospatial business intelligence expertise for geospatial data interoperability programs, enabling, enabling federally developed technology transfers to the private sector for societal benefit. Uh, Dr. Johnson has 25 plus years of experience and has worked in and with over 180 countries um, related to global new space and old space assets. She was recently awarded a certificate of completion for the Senior Managers in Government program in 2019 at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And she obtained her doctorate degree in management with a focus on economics and technology transfer from the Weatherhead School of Business uh, from Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio. Shawana, welcome. Un unmute yourself there, Shawana. Thank there you, you Kevin. Thanks for guiding our panel and for the time you invested to do that. Thank you, Nathan, for all the work you do for IEEE IGARS. And hello to everyone. I recognize a lot of names popping up, so thank you for joining us. And to everyone else out there in Zoom land, welcome. So this is my agenda today. And um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the housekeeping of doing pitches in virtual land or Zoom land or Google Hangouts or Microsoft Teams, whatever it is you use. So uh, it's pretty simple, but it's really important. And um, you need to uh, look at the lighting. So test yourself in terms of how you look in the lighting. Reduce distractions, whatever they may be. Declutter your room, turn off other sounds, uh, check your bandwidth so you don't go down in the middle of the presentation. And whether you're doing the pitch alone or with a team, like this panel did yesterday, practice, practice, practice. Um, why are these things important? You need to keep the attention of those investors and virtual attention is difficult and you all know what I mean. You're looking at email, you're checking Slack, WhatsApp, your text messages, you get about 10 to 20% less attention in a virtual meeting than you do in a real meeting. So uh, virtual is difficult, but the good news is the investors say they're still asking for the same things in the pitch. So next slide. Um, so the, the key thing is to choose, and Caroline referred to this already. Caroline said, find the right fit. I say, know your own space, know your space, and know who it is you're going to go to to try and get financing from. Look at the websites of all these um, investors. Uh, they can, it will tell you the exact stage, and Caroline and um, Kevin referred to those stages, what stage they're in, what sector they're in, and what location geographically that they invest in. And why is this important? Well, it's going to help you to understand who to go to first. Remember Caroline said you might give up to 200 pitches. Um, so I say go to your least favorite folks that you wanna pitch first. Why? Because you're going to get better and better and your pitch is actually going to become more concise, more sharp, and more focused. So pick your investors, rack and stack them, and then make a really difficult personal decision. Do you want investors that are active or passive? Remember, you're putting your hands in the po their pockets to take money. So remember what Caroline said about angels and guidance? You wanna select a venture group that will help you grow your business and be active in your management team and send you good leads and help you grow your business. Now I know what you're thinking. You're saying, yes, but it's my business. But remember, you put your hand in their pocket to take their money and you're gonna have to pay the piper for that, so to speak. So next slide. There are three major things that you have to address before you meet with your um, potential investors. The first is market. You must answer this question and you must find as much information on it. 
Do you have a market to go after? And is there a market need? Second, timing. Do you, is it the right time for you to jump into the market per se? And the third thing, do you have the right team? Do you have a right team in place? Or is it that you do need this venture money or investment money to get you to the right team? These three things are things you should thoroughly go through and answer for yourself before you ask for more money. What are the top five do's of pitching uh, investors? You have to clearly talk to them about what you do and who your team is. Why are you easier to use? What kind of function do you provide? How can you, why is monetizing uh, with you better than doing anything with your competitors? Who are your founders and key members? And remember, COVID-19 has produced a lot of focus on startup teams, including business focus. And last but not least, you've got about 15 slides to make your impact in. Do your market research. Market research has to show how big the market is you wanna go after and dive right down to your specific capability because you must demonstrate how you're going to differentiate yourself from the competition. Next slide. So then, what are the top five things they don't want you to do? Please, if you have a way to do a live demo, if you have a um, software as a service or a data analytics product, any kind of video, show live demos. You can always have backup in the background, but don't forget to do a live demo if you can. Also, um, us don't assume they understand your capabilities. You have to tell them why others uh, like your product or service, um, what your product milestones are, and what the differentiated features are. Now, Kevin Pomfret pointed out the key areas, and I'll add one more thought to what he told you about IP and patents. Um, it's really important that if you already have any prior problems with prior em uh, employees or team members that might have a potential claim on your IP or patents, please let them know that up front uh, because they will research into you and they will find it. You have to say what safeguards you're taking to protect your intellectual property. I am working with over 10 or 20, 10 to 20 about geospatial companies right now that are in some form of IP or patent dispute. And don't forget to practice, practice, practice. Next slide. So forget about listening to me. Let's talk about what real investors, uh, I went out and asked two of my favorite folks, tell me exactly what you like and you don't like in this land of virtual pitches. I went to Paladin Capital Group and Timothy Richard, Richardson, who's a venture partner. He's a CEO of multiple successful startups and more importantly, of successful exits. So he's made a lot of money in this space. And here's what they told me, next slide. Explain the problem. Make sure you are very clear at what it is your customers need and how you're going to solve that problem. And the key benefits they told me is, you need to have a CEO up in front of them pitching who understands the business, has a plan that addresses um, all the talents required and all the functions required in the business, and can talk about how that team's gonna execute on the plan. And oh, by the way, then they mentioned you need to have an executable well thought out plan and a great idea without a market plan and IP protection is just that, it's a great idea. So you get the theme, great plan, great plan. Good origin stories, market verification, concise uh, use of how you're gonna use the money and the number one takeaway, make sure you ask them for what you want. The very final quote they gave me was, you'd be surprised at how many startups just leave things hanging at the end of a presentation. Next slide. Here's the things that they said were their least favorite topics um, and things that people pitched to them. Don't assume 
that they understand the market the way you do. You, you need to go into the meeting and you're the expert. And don't forget to put emphasis on the key elements of what you bring to the table, your team, your traction that you might already have in technology readiness levels, and the market plans you have in place. Don't just say we're in a massive market. You must break it down to a target market and say, well, you'll be spending your time. If you're a passionate entrepreneur, you should be comfortable talking about your problem and solution. Don't show fuzzy plans uh, and don't be too cool, too sloppy, too arrogant, too sleepy, too late to the meeting or actually fall asleep in the meeting. They've seen it all. You have to listen to what questions they're asking you and don't dodge questions. Number one thing they said, don't be a robot on stage. If you're not good in front of the camera, send somebody else on your team to do the pitch and you back that up for them. That's it for today. Thank you. All right, Shawana, thank you very much. And um, well, again, so many great points in there. One thing that jumped out at me, I went to a uh, live uh, pitch competition where investors uh, invested right on the spot. And then at the end, the investors spoke. They told us what they were, had been looking for, why they made the decisions they did. And I remember uh, one investor, she said, I don't care how good your idea is. If you don't have the team uh, put together to execute it, I'm not investing in you. So really, really important um, uh, comments there. All right. And there's some additional uh, ways to get in touch with Shawana. So again, thank you, Shawana, for that. All right. And that brings us to me. Uh, so again, I'm Kevin Corbley. I'm the president of Corbley Communications, and my topic is marketing your startup, exploiting your USP. Um, and for 27 years, I've had my own business, a marketing communications business, providing strategic communications and uh, business development services to geospatial uh, organizations around the world. Uh, and I've worked with a lot of startups, a lot of the well-known startups. I've worked on their team as a consultant uh, early on, Space image, Imaging, Digital Globe, uh, Orb Image, uh, RapidEye, um, RadarSat. So those are some pretty, uh, pretty big names. Um, but I've also done quite a bit of work uh, with uh, business plan competitions. And uh, I have to tell you that, that one of the things uh, I have, um, I've seen in many business plans is, that there is, there's no provision for marketing and sales. That's that just, it's an afterthought. Well, um, that, and, and those uh, teams don't do very well in the business plan competitions. And I think what goes on, especially when there's a scientist or an engineer who's starting a company, has a great idea for a product or a service, they have that mentality of, I build it, the customers will come. And unfortunately, it doesn't usually work out that way. And that's why you have to make marketing an integral part of the, the very foundational plan for your business. So, um, and so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So I'm gonna talk about the must-haves in marketing. What is that USP that I keep talking about? Then I'm gonna talk about the three most cost-effective traditional marketing activities, as well as a couple of newer types of uh, marketing uh, uh, content activities, and then ways to deliver your content. All right, so we, this, these are the must-haves. I don't care what kind of business you're starting, uh, what industry you're in, whatever, you have to have a professional website with SEO. And I can't stress the SEO part enough. It's gotten so important that in my opinion, you know, don't even bother creating a website if you're not gonna invest money in search engine optimization. We could do a whole other uh, webinar on that, but it's, it's very important. And let me put a quick plug in for paid advertising, whether in print or online, sometimes that gets overlooked these days. But um, you, it, advertising does many things. Obviously, it positions your company. It helps to sell products. Um, it also buys editorial space, which uh, really you can't overlook that in marketing. But I want you to remember, uh, if you think back, especially when you were in school, a lot of times you were learning out of textbooks, even textbooks that are digital now, they're out of date. Uh, often by several years. And you know where the, the main up-to-date education is happening right now? 
it's happening in trade publications that are, you know, the information in them is usually good as of, as of about a week ago in a lot of cases, depending on if they're print or online. So you, you have to support uh, advertising. All right, so here, let's get to this question. What is a USP? That's your unique selling proposition. And one of the nice things about a startup is that the unique selling proposition is, is what sets your product, service, or your company apart from others. And um, for most startups, it's the reason you went into business. So it ought to be fresh in your mind uh, when you're in a startup phase. Believe me, I've uh, had other companies that are, that are years or decades old, and they just haven't thought about what their USP is lately. So you really uh, probably already know it if you're starting a business. Um, but kind of to summarize it, it's the reason customers are gonna buy from you instead of the competition. That's why it's so important. Um, and so, so it's, it's what's gonna be the basis for your, uh, your marketing. And because marketing really is messaging. So what you're gonna do is you're going to, to create your messaging, you're gonna translate your unique selling proposition into the benefits to the customers. In other words, you're not gonna focus your marketing and messaging on the features of your product, but on the benefits they provide to customers. And, and I can tell you uh, right now that about 99% of uh, benefits uh, messaging, it comes down to how your product or service helps customers do their jobs faster, better, cheaper, safer. Remember those four things, faster, better, cheaper, safer. That's what it comes down to. So that's the lead in on, on the USP and the messaging. So now we get to that question. Okay, we've got some great messages. How are we gonna deliver those to our target audiences? And, and that's really the challenge of marketing. Um, and the question that I get asked all the time by startups is there are so many different marketing activities you can engage in, dozens and dozens that I could go into, but most startups do not have unlimited budgets and they wanna know, you know what, what are those, those just handful of activities I can engage in that are gonna give me the best bang for uh, a limited amount of money. So here they are. Uh, real quickly, I'm going to go through them. Feature articles and case studies, uh, which you get published in a magazine, or maybe you get it published online, or even just on your own website these days. A lot of places you can put a feature article. Here is what a feature, a case study feature article is. It's a real life success story about how one of your clients used your product or service, again, to do their jobs faster, better, cheaper, safer. And uh, that's what the article is all about. Believe me, feature article, articles are as good as gold. They sell products and services for you. All right, the second uh, type of traditional content is the press release. Um, every company ought to be doing press releases all the time. Well, uh, not all the time, but when you have real news. Uh, so again, press releases inform your customers of what you're up to. Maybe if you've got a new product coming out, for instance. Um, and uh, also, they, uh, they, they position the company a little bit. But um, the most important thing to remember, press release versus an article is, when you submit an article, you submit it at least one place at a time, one publication. Press release, you blast out to many, many publications uh, simultaneously. And the final is the blog. I love blogs. Uh, they're you know, relatively new. Um, but they do a number of things. Remember I talked about SEO, search engine optimization. They are what keep your website up to date and very high in the ranking. So that's just from a practical st standpoint. But your blog can do so many things. It can be short, it can be long, but it needs to be uh, periodic. I would say at least once a week you want to publish something. Um, but it can be used to educate your audience, inform them about what's new with your company. Um, you can have techie tips. If you've got a product that maybe is very technical, put some tips out there. You can also do visionary type blogs, you know, trends you're seeing uh, in the industry. So those are the top three. And those are, again, those are kind of traditional, um, but I do want to mention um, kind of the, the, the more recently newer uh, type of content uh, that you can create uh, in content marketing, uh, podcasts and videos. And these just in the past year have become so, so popular uh, here in the, the COVID era uh, because we're, we're looking for new ways to, uh, to meet with people. Podcasts, that's strictly an audio recording. Um, they're very easy, very cheap uh, to create. 
Um, I use I, I use a thirty five dollar uh, recorder to to do mine. Uh, you, however, there are a lot of apps you can put on your phone or right on your uh, laptop computer to record um, host them. You can. Uh, it's usually best to have them hosted on a third-party website instead of your own. So I use one called Podomatic. There are several out there. Podomatic is quite good. Uh, editing, basic editing software. There's Audacity, which uh, is free. I don't know how they they uh, stay alive, but it's an unbelievable uh, software. So um, all kinds of things you can do on podcasts. You can do interviews with people. You can, again, have a CEO uh, talking about vision, company vision and things like that. Just keep them short. I would say you want to be uh, less than 10 minutes. All right, video. And a video, as I say, just here in the last three or four months has become so popular. There are really three types of video you should consider. The first is uh, kind of like that video, um, fancy uh, video that you pay a third party professional company to make. It's you know maybe like a, a brochure for your company. Uh, those can be very pricey, but um, they're great to have as a, a splash on your website when people log on. Um, but then there are webinars, just like we're doing now. A lot of my clients are doing educational webinars. And, and keep in mind, when you're doing a webinar that's supposed to be educational, it, it needs to be educating people, not just a blatant marketing um, uh, advertisement for your product. You really want to get some customers on there talking about, again, how they're uh, using your product or service. Uh, finally, online training. This is something that I think a lot of companies are falling short on, but um, these days you, it doesn't take a lot to do your own online training videos. There's a, a great software package called Camtasia that is terrific for making online tutorials. So if you've got a, a, a hardware or software product that people need to learn how to, how to use, you ought to have a lot of tutorials and training videos uh, on your website or, or up on uh, Vimeo or uh, YouTube. Um, and I suggest two different types. You want to have longer workflow type how-to uh, tutorials as well as real short little snippets on here's how to do one specific thing with our software or our, uh, our hardware. So um, really, really important to uh, consider that. All right. So again, so we talked that uh, content is a, um, a way to deliver your messaging. So how are you going to deliver your content? Obviously, we talked about the website. Social media, I just want to drive home the point. Social media is not an end unto itself. It is merely a vehicle, a channel to get your content out there. Uh, so use it wisely and, and reserve it for good content. LinkedIn, I think, is number one for businesses. Don't forget about posting information in the LinkedIn groups that are relevant. They're very powerful. A lot of people follow those. Facebook, it, I found uh, it works for some businesses, uh, others not so much, but there are some really good Facebook groups related to geospatial. So look them up and a uh, great place to post your information. Twitter, um, again, in the business to business sector, I'm not seeing a lot of traction with Twitter. Uh, I've, I've heard stories where people have, have some good experiences. I think Twitter is starting to fade in terms of uh, business to business, maybe business to consumer, it'll continue, I don't know. I like Instagram as kind of, it's not new really, but um, it's a great way because geospatial is such a graphical uh, industry. It's a great way to get imagery out there and maps and uh, you know putting a link to a press release. So don't forget Instagram. And there are a lot of others, but those are the, the top four right now. I bet that'll change within the next year or so. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you for joining me for uh, that topic on uh, unique selling propositions and marketing. So at this point, what we are going to do, we're going to open it up to the questions and questions are already coming in. Um, so go ahead and, and send them in through the chat window. Uh, we have a few already. And um, so I'm going to ask the uh, panelists to unmute yourself. And uh, Kevin Pomfrey, it looks like the first question, not surprisingly, is, is for you. Someone says, I've always wanted to ask about copyright law. Is, is um, code considered copyrightable? If so, how do you do so? Is it enough to put a header comment saying this code is copyrighted to such and such an organization uh, in the code file? Kevin, what do you have to say about that? So yes, code is can be copyrightable. It depends on the on the code and and how it's used and developed. Um, but yes, it can be. Uh, 
with regard to how you do it, that that's really a more facts. I, I I saw the question in the chat room as well, and as I as I had responded to the to, to Shauna, it it really it's it's a more complicated, nuanced answer in terms of how to best to do it, and and so that that one is um, you know if you want, do want to have something copyrighted, um, you know it's best to talk to a lawyer because it depends on how it's being deployed and you know what you're trying to protect. Do you want to register that type of thing? Okay, great. And um, this next one, um, this is going to go to Caroline. Caroline, someone wants to know if you have any information about how different it is to um, finance a startup in the United States versus outside the United States. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of having success in startups is building that ecosystem within you know, universities who are advocating for startups and teaching entrepreneurship in their programs to governments that are also supportive of that. Uh, so it, it can be more challenging, particularly in less developed uh, startup ecosystems to, to just find funding for startups. I think the advice is the same uh, and the process is the same, but it certainly can be more challenging. The advice that I would give to someone who is perhaps in, a, in an ecosystem that's a little earlier on is actually take a lot of the uh, concepts that Kevin Corbley talked about with regards to make an investment in your own personal branding and being a thought leader in that space. And there are many ways to do that through sharing articles on LinkedIn, to create a podcast. Ultimately, if you can be seen as a thought leader and an innovator in whatever ecosystem you're in, there are global ways to make these connections. The last thing that I would tell you, whether you're in a early stage ecosystem or whether in your super well staged ecosystem is anytime you talk to an investor and you get a no, whether it happens immediately or after several conversations, it is absolutely appropriate and expected that you would ask for um, other investors that that potential investor could pass you along to. And that's how you can network. Uh, if it's not within your own backyard because the ecosystem isn't there, to connect with a stronger ecosystem that's somewhere else. Great, terrific, all right. And uh, Shawana, the next question's for you. This is kind of an interesting question. I never thought about this. The person I'll just summarize here is basically saying, uh, you do a pitch, you get a comment back from, uh, from the potential investors. Um, and, uh, you know, should you change your whole pitch based on that one comment? I mean, how, in other words, how much should you wait uh, a given comment from a, an investment team, um, you know, as you're moving on to your next uh, pitch? Uh, that's a great question as well. But remember I said, before you do anything, do your homework on the investors and you will find that they live in um, a certain segment that they typically fund, whether it's angels or angel investors or A round, B round, C round investors, what businesses do they invest in? And if they are in your sweet spot, if they typically invest in the market sector that you're going to be in, if they typically invest in the geographical location you're going to start in, if you've ranked and stacked your investors well, um, you then can weigh that comment against where do they lie on your investor list. So if they're the top, if for you, you're like, oh, that's the best investor I could possibly have. And they're the ones that make the comment and you want to go after those kinds of investors, make the change. Um, if it's early on, remember what Caroline said, 200 no's. If it's early on and in your heart and soul and spirit and you talk with your team, and you don't think the comment fits well, um, chalk it up to that was the least fit category of particular investor pitches, and I'm not going to make that big change. So you have to keep track of who you're talking to and where they fit and what it is you want to ultimately accomplish. Great, great, okay. and. Um, and the next question, actually, this is a question that came in before we even got started. This person was really eager. They must have anticipated what I was going to say. 
uh, because they talked about a really important project that startups face. You know, how do you market a startup when you don't have a track record of success? You, you don't have success stories to tell. Um, that is such a great question. I've faced that with so many companies, so many of my clients. So there's two things I wanna comment. First of all, when you're talking about your unique selling proposition, um, there's a corporate level of unique selling proposition as well. In other words, and that's where you focus on the team. So a lot of times early on, you've really got to market your team and its expertise if you really don't have a uh, you know, product available yet. The second thing is, and I know this happened with one of, the, um, one of the imaging, satellite imaging companies, they wanted to prepare the market for their brand new type of uh, imagery that was going to be huge files, very high resolution, but the satellite wasn't launched yet. It wasn't even gonna be launched for a couple of years. So what they did was they created some, um, some kind of you know, demo data sets and they started feeding those out to the market to use. And uh, also, if you need to get some success stories under your belt, you might need to consider early on uh, beta investor, uh, in beta testers and where you uh, give them some data, your product, whatever it is, and ask them to use it. And in return, you get to, uh, to uh, promote a little bit uh, the whatever kind of uh, achievements they got. So that's something that a lot of startups face. All right, um, let's see. All right, um, this one, this either for Shawana or, or Caroline, um, you know, how do you get started in your investor research? I think Caroline, you touched a little bit on it, but um, is it Crunchbase or other websites, paid contract advisors, or, you know, what are some options out there? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and then Shawana, I'm sure you'll, you'll have uh, value to add. I'm not a big fan of kind of paid agents. Um, again, I think it, this is a very relationship-based business. And so that authenticity in having warm introductions and kind of moving throughout your sphere of colleagues and friendships and people that you work with really is the best way to network through. Um, as far as where to target, you know, there's, there's no good one place to look. If you're in the U.S. and you're looking for grants, um, there's not even one place there. There's many places. So you can look at grants.gov. You can look at sba.gov, the Small Business Administration, uh, challenge.gov. But a simple internet search will kind of get you to the right place. Additionally, for grants on the corporate side, you know, think about who the natural fit would be to fund your company, probably a company that's in the same space or which could be a customer of yours or vice versa, and do a little perusing on the website to see if you can find anything. I will tell you that Crunchbase is a good resource. Uh, one of the logos that I had on my slides was a platform called Gust. There's also another one called Angel List. When you get to that level of funding, I'd encourage you to take all of Shawana's great advice, create a pitch deck and a page on there, and you'll see some traffic back and forth with matching angel investors to startups. Um, there are also, you know, a lot of the examples that Kevin Corbally gave with regards to uh, LinkedIn sources to just network and really like you would any other time when you're trying to find a job. Get in front of as many people as you can and make sure that you ask them at the end of any conversation for additional contacts to talk to. Shawana, would you like to jump in and add something? I just ditto that first comment. Don't try not to use a paid uh, person to go to VCs. Um, people in the industry you're in, there will be subject matter experts that are always willing to assist you and help you get started. And most of the time, um, you'll, you'll know if they're a paid of a hired gun, so to speak, if you look at their LinkedIn and you see they've been working with lots and lots of companies over the past three years, that's not an individual who has any in-depth expertise uh, working in that area. They may just have um, set up contracts so they can get a percentage if they happen to get lucky and find a unique technology. So I completely agree with Caroline's first comment. Oh, Kevin, I've got a couple of points as well, if I could jump in. Um, 
One is, I think it's useful, and I think these are the points that Caroline and Chawana is making, but you know, much like I, the geospatial community is an ecosystem, the, the, the funding, bus, the, the, the private funding community within, within a, a state or a city or even nationally and internationally now is, a, is also an ecosystem. And it's an ecosystem um, and you've got you know, people, the finance, you've got the lawyers, you've got the accountants, you've got the investment bankers, you've got a, you've got a bunch of people. So um, you know, use them as well as you move through this, this process and, and you think about this. Now, I will tell you, having been a lawyer that's, that's worked with you know, a number of folks with just an idea, um, you know, there's a certain amount of um, education, and I think this is a good step, but there's more that you need to do to show that you, you know, you have thought it through. It's not, you know, we've all been approached by people who just have an idea and they expect someone to fund it right away because it's going to change the world, right? I mean, you need to understand the, the this new ecosystem and what they're looking for and what valuations are and the stages that Caroline came up with and what, you know, Ke Kevin's comment about, you know, what's your product, um, unique product sale is, all, all of those things. But you know, you can rely on those people to sort of help make those introductions if they think you, you know, have the qualifications and the and the input and the and the thoughts. The other thing I would point out, and you know, that Shawana made to sort of build on that is, and I mentioned securities laws in my presentation. You need to be careful when you're out there investing. You're getting people to um, help find you money and get equity um, in return because some folks will do that. Security law is 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 really down on that, and and there are a number of things you need to need to consider. And people will tell you, oh, don't worry about it. I can do this. I've done for other people. But then what happens is as you get into later rounds and later financing, and you get institutions like venture capitals in, and they start looking at your documents, and they realize you've done something wrong. If you are planning to go that big IPO road, that can be a problem. So again. You know, you need to, you need, you've got an idea, you, but you need to start thinking to yourself as to where you want to be, how you want to get there, and making sure you start acting like that from very early on. Great. All right. Terrific. Just a, we're going to do a couple more questions here. Uh, one real quick one came in to me about professional marketing videos. What's the average uh, cost? Uh, well, they asked about a five minute video, but it costs per minute. Um, videos professionally done, the, those kind are uh, very, can be very expensive. I mean, the minimum you're probably gonna look at is about 3,000 a minute. Um, however, easily up to 10,000 a minute. Uh, I did a video uh, for a government agency a while back and because we had a lot of animation created, uh, we, were, we were well over 10,000 a minute on that, uh, that video. So, so just that's kind of a, a guideline starting point. Um, another quick question, I think um, this, Kevin, I think this is going to go to you, Kevin Pomfret. Um, is there a conflict of interest to work on a startup while you're working at a university as a researcher? So I guess there's a couple of issues there. One is if you're under some sort of contract with respect to um, you know your your work there, and whether there's a the, the, there are provisions in there regarding your employment. You also have to worry about any intellectual property that you generate and what the university's policies is, both in your agreement with them, but just broadly that maybe they've referenced somewhere else. So uh, it, it's an issue to consider if you wanna, if you wanna do that. Um, I can't say it's one way or the other all the time. You need to do a little more research on that before you go down that path. All right, sounds good. And um, you know, I think that's pretty much it on the questions. There's kind of a long question here about NDAs. I'm gonna ask uh, uh, Kevin Pomfret maybe to to answer that one via email to that uh, questioner. And we're, we're a little over time, so we're gonna wrap up right now. I'm just going to, I'm gonna wrap up by saying a couple things for people thinking about starting, um, starting some kind of business or a new product. I was sitting at a, a conference years ago, Shawan, I think you were actually sitting next to me in Montreux, Switzerland, and the, um, yes. the keynote speaker at lunch, he made the point about how fast technology is, um, is, is moving. And um, to make that point, he talked about one of the Wright brothers, I think it was Wilbur, um, was, was still alive when Neil Armstrong was born. In fact, uh, th this Wright brother uh, died when Neil Armstrong was 18, just entering college. So think about that overlap. You know, the, the, one of the first men to uh, fly a plane uh, to the first man to step on, on the moon. 
pretty amazing in just uh, less than a lifetime. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about creating some new uh, idea, you've got a concept, think out of the box. Just remember that Thomas Edison didn't create the light bulb by making technical improvements on the candle. So it's really important to sometimes just think out of the box, think like Elon Musk. So that's it for me, but I'm gonna turn it back over to Nathan Longbotham who's gonna come on for a final wrap up. All right, thank you all. I really appreciate the panelists and all the presenters uh, coming on today. This has um, been a particular treat uh, to uh, provide this sort of content to the community. So I appreciate you all making the time for this. Um, so thank you for the, uh, to the audience for joining. Um, just one last reminder, uh, we have a lot of GRS ac GRSS activities that are going on through the rest of the fall. And uh, specifically, iGARS is happening next week, uh, $10 registration fee. So it's very approachable if you wanna jump in and learn about all sorts of the uh, geospatial, the, the technology that's available in the geospatial world in our community. Um, and yeah, so please join in, follow us at uh, the various social media channels I've put in chat uh, to keep in touch and continue moving the, the, this sort of content forward. I would love to get feedback about how this particular content um, was received and what other additional information or, or content that you would like to see produced by GRSS for, for our community. So thank you all for joining. Again, uh, Kevin, Carolyn, Shawana, Kevin, thank you again very much. I appreciate the time you put into um, putting this together. Everyone have a good day and I look thank forward you. to seeing you at the next uh, event. Thank Thanks. you. Thanks Bye. everybody.